call this meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. I want to welcome everyone who's in attendance tonight and also those that are viewing the meeting on G10 television. Uh, to begin with tonight, uh, we're going to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Robert Warden, followed by the invocation by our City Attorney John Carter. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks. We give thanks for your blessings upon us, individually and upon our city. We give thanks for this beautiful day you have given to us to enjoy. We pray for our military members who are serving us here and around the world. We pray for their safety, and we pray for their anxious families. We pray for our mayor and our council, and especially as they enter the budget deliberations. Their decisions will have effect upon our city and upon its taxpayers, and they're entering a most difficult budget year. We pray your guidance and direction would be with them in all of their deliberations. All of this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Council, at your places, you, we all have copies of the uh, agenda and the consent items for tonight's meeting. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Next, we have the approval of minutes, and we have one April 8, 2014 regular meeting. Mayor Phillips, I move that we approve the April 8, 2014 regular meeting minutes as presented. A second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Tonight we have a presentation, uh, and this will be a report from the uh, Public Safety Department uh, Child Abuse Prevention. And Chief Unero, uh, you'll start this uh, presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Council. <clears throat> I have an opportunity to talk about something that I'm very passionate about. And I do appreciate that, uh, that our partners are here, uh, Don Rochelle, Anne-Marie Raymond, and Kathleen Holbrook from the Child Advocacy Center. And it's, it's kind of fitting that we do it during, this, uh, during the budget session because it, it, this partnership does save us money, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But just to give you a little um, background on the Child Advocacy Center, this, this initiative started several years ago. And the Child Advocacy Centers is really a child-focused, community-oriented facility. And it aids in, in child abuse investigations. Um, the first Child Advocacy Center was, was developed in Huntsville. And one of the things that's happened recently is that our Child Advocacy Center here in Jacksonville received its accreditation, which is, which is really a big deal when you talk about that. <clears throat> Over 90% of child victims are abused by someone they know. Um, you know, I think that it's so important, and, and when I briefed the council several years ago, one of the things that we discussed was that um, because of deployments and because of the fact that we're a young, young community, that child abuse is a problem in our community. And the Child Advocacy Center helps us solve those problems and I think it's really important to talk about how it solves those particular issues. <clears throat> the investigation with a child advocacy center without a, a child advocacy and I had the I had actually when I was a detective many years ago um, I worked child abuse cases and I worked them with a CAC and without a CAC and I think the most important thing that you really have to talk about is the fact that children who, who, when you don't have a CAC, are interviewed typically 15 times. Child, the uh, police department, 
the initial patrol officer, the detective, the uh, Department of Social Services, maybe a counseling, uh, the district attorney's office, they all do them at, a, at the same time. And that, that, that tends to re-victimize the child. And as, as the mayor pro tem said at the Ch State of the Child Breakfast, this process with the Child Advocacy Center gives us the opportunity to make the child whole. And part of that starts from the initial investigation. And with the Child, Advo with the child Advocacy Center, we only interview that, that, uh, that child one time. It's a multidisciplinary team, so all the team members come together. I, I remember it used to be we'd send them from our police department down to the uh, Department of Social Services. They would be interviewed there. And if you've ever been to a police department, it's kind of a scary place. So, but a child advocacy center is designed for children. So it's, it's about not re-victimizing the children. And now I think uh, we have a, a short video that kind of tells you about the child advocacy center in uh, Onslow County. So. Welcome to the Child Advocacy Center of Onslow County. I'm Kathleen Holbrook, the director. Here at the Child Advocacy Center, we evaluate all local children who are alleged victims of sexual abuse or physical abuse. This is a very child-friendly environment. A local artist, Karen Edwards, painted all of the murals on our walls. Children have different perceptions. They have a different mindset. So the Child Advocacy Center is designed just for those types of cases when we have to interview children, especially about sexual assaults and, uh, and rapes and things like that. So things that, that are traumatic to the child, that's when we use the CAC. It's, it's really based upon the concept that what we're going to do is start to heal the child as we, can, as we do the investigation. And we come into this room here, which is our child interview room. And we give the child an opportunity to choose where they would like to sit. Many children choose to sit here at the table because during the time that they're talking with the interviewer, they can engage in activities such as drawing pictures, writing, or playing with Play-Doh. Or they can sit over here in one of these comfortable easy chairs and talk with the interviewer. We have two cameras in this room so that the investigative team members who are part of the evaluation can watch the interview as it takes place live. So we have one camera on the wall here and we have another one up there in the corner. And we tell the children in advance that they are going to be on camera and that team members are observing them, but because the cameras are unobtrusive, they immediately forget about the cameras. We also have two microphones, one in the ceiling and one over here on the wall and that way the team can pick up anything that the child says. We review it on a screen in a separate room while the interview is taking place. If the child is, you know, apprehensive about talking to law enforcement or seeing law enforcement, um, they don't have to have any contact with us before the interview begins. We're behind the scenes um, before the interview and after the interview is complete and then at that time we make contact with the parents and a lot of times we do make contact with the children at the center but it's after the interview is complete. We kind of introduce ourselves and kind of interact with them a little bit and just to kind of get them comfortable with us. This is the team observation room which is where the members of the investigative team sit throughout the interview. 
So we have a big screen TV where they can watch the interview take place live as it is occurring and the interviewer and the child would be alone in that room. And this is our medical room where children will receive comprehensive medical evaluations. All of the children we see here are here because allegations of sexual abuse or physical abuse have been made. But we do not focus on the injuries that they may have incurred. We do a comprehensive head to toe evaluation of that child. So we look in their eyes, their ears, their skin. We evaluate every inch of them. Locally, just a little, uh, um, we have our, our CAC has um, evaluated 810 children. Our, our prosecution rate is about 93%. You know, it is about the children, and, and I, you know, I think about this a lot of times, and I know the mayor can, uh, can kind of uh, relate to what I have to say. So many times in law enforcement, we don't have the opportunity really to, to, to help the victims because we're concerned with the prosecution of the case. So the victims and the victims' needs kind of fall through the cracks. And even, for example, we have one victim advocate for all the victims of crimes that we have. So a lot of their needs fall through the cracks. Well, the Child Advocacy Center, when we talk about making the child whole, gives the victim back something that's been taken, and that's their innocence. You know, when a child's innocence is taken away, it, you know, it needs to, get, they need to get it back. And, and the process that we go through not only safeguards prosecution, but it safeguards that, that innocence and tries to replace that innocence. You know, we talk about being so, so cost effective and, um, and looking at cost effective ways. This is a cost effective way because when you replace that innocence with that child, they grow up to be a productive member of the community. And it's also about justice when we talk about the, the children. You know, a lot of times children are used to, uh, as, as instruments, especially in divorces and things like that. This process helps us determine what justice is. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a great process for making sure that the claims that the child has made uh, are actually true. And when you look at that, that birth to five years old, those are, those are ch children that can't talk. Those are victims that can't speak. And the center gives us those opportunities. Gives us those opportunities to prosecute people who, who victimize those innocent children. And to replace that innocence so that child doesn't grow up. I mean, I can tell you numerous murderers that I interviewed many years ago. And one of the common themes was I was abused as a ch child. This process, this, this process in our community helps prevent that. And when we talk about being cost effective and we talk about how we can make our community better, this is, this is one of the processes that really excites me because it gives that victim back what they need. It makes that child whole again. It returns them to that innocent state. And, you know, what a, what a great opportunity for us as the police department to be partners in, a, in, a, uh, in an endeavor such as this. So I'll be glad to entertain any questions. I know, uh, I know the uh, CAC staff be glad to entertain any questions. Anybody on council have any questions or comments? Mayor, I just want to say that I attended the event and, and I'd like to thank Chief Yanero, Dawn and her team. It's just a, it's a very inspiring event and the work that the agencies do and collaborate and work together for, you know, to help our children and our community is just, it, it, 
sends shivers down your spine. And, and I want to thank all of you. And thank you for coming today to share the story with us. I think it's important. You know, it was, it was great. We were talking about the budget earlier and, and, uh, and how much police services cost. But here's an opportunity, the 810 children. We actually saved $1,000 per, per um, investigation, which is really cost effective in this partnership. You know, we were using Teddy Bear, which we were going to uh, Greenville before. That doesn't even include the officer's time where they had to drive to, to Teddy Bear. That's just the cost of that investigation by making it much more effective and much more efficient. And you know, when, uh, when Dr. Woodruff talks about the three E's, I think from our standpoint, from the police department standpoint, this is a great opportunity for us to, to really talk about being effective and efficient um, you know, in our community. And I, and I do appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about this because, like I said, it's one of my passions because it's one of the few times we actually make that victim whole again. Even with the prosecutions and other crimes, it's, it's, you know, that's, that's a difficult process because yeah, this, is, this is a process where we can make that child whole again, and it's great to have it in our community. Thank you, Thanks, Mayor, Chief. Council. Thank you, Chief. Ladies, I uh, want to thank you all for coming out tonight to, to back the Chief up. I uh, <laughs> thought you were going to be his backup singers, but uh, I really appreciate what you do for our community here and the service that you provide over there. I was, you know, looking at the video there. I remember going out to the uh, Child Advocacy Center, and it was such a happy place. You know, I mean, this, it, and I can see how it would be so, con so soothing and conducive to uh, to a child that's troubled or, or and, and you know, in in crisis. But I can't say enough uh, to commend you for what you do for this community. Thank you very much. Mayor, before you move to public comment, we do have one other presentation. Uh, Ron, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Richard. And if I could ask the mayor to please step down for just a moment, Mayor Phillips. We have a special presentation today, and I'm glad you all can be here with us. It is my privilege and honor to make a special presentation tonight to a very special person, Mayor Sammy Phillips. <laughs> you. Tonight is your special night. When I was asked to make this presentation, I thought um, I would just say a few words and present you with the certificate that's in my hand. But after looking at it and really thinking about it, I thought it would be really improper to do that because of your impact to this city. And reflecting your 40 years of service to this city deserves a bit more than just a few words. And so today I am honored to share your biography with the audience. And although the biography is not with all the details of over 40 years of service, it certainly will touch on the highlights. So before I start, I thought it would be important, and Dr. Woodruff, you know, with his intelligence, helped me out here. We need to go back to 1974. So, what happened in 1974? Well, the average annual wage in 1974 was $8,031. I was making well under record. Okay. <laughs> okay, who knows what the cost of gas was in 1974? Uh-huh. 53 cents per gallon. Okay, pretty close. And this is one for Bob. Who won the 1974 NCAA basketball championship? None other than NC State. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> and for those of you who, who like movies and books, the book Jaws was introduced and the movie. Um, first class postage was 10 cents, and it was just raised from 8 cents. You should have. I hope that uh, that shares a little bit of difference between then and today. Mayor Sammy Phillips is a native of Jacksonville and graduated from Jacksonville High School. He attended Coastal Care. <laughs> That's a good start. 
He attended Coastal Carolina Community College and joined the Jacksonville Police Department on March 18, 1974. Did we show the hippie yet? Is, 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 not yet? Okay. <laughs> Mayor Phillips served with the Jacksonville Police Department for 30 years and retired November of 2004. While on the force, he was a patrol officer, a detective, and retired as a deputy police chief, among probably many other duties that wasn't shared in the bio that I read. Sammy successfully completed the FBI National Academy in 1998, and while working, he took night classes and earned his bachelor's degree in criminal justice from North Carolina Wesleyan College. Of course, that wasn't enough for Mayor Phillips. He spent the next two years uh, driving back and forth from ECU and earned his master's degree in public administration. And he earned that in December of 2000. And of course, his call to, to service did not end with his 30 years after retiring. In July of 2004, he decided to run for city council as an at-large member. I remember that well because it was the same time that I ran for Ward 3, and thinking back, I didn't know him very well. I knew him, but I didn't know him well at the time. And uh, this guy meant business. I mean, he had signs everywhere. He was knocking door to door, and I own a sign company. I'm thinking, how's he getting all these signs out? It's a one-man band. And I remember thinking, you know, how am I going to how am I going to work with this guy? And of course, after a resounding victory, he he captured one of the at-large seats. In November of 2007, another victory came upon him and became mayor, Mayor Sammy Phillips in 2007. And of course, I've had the honor and privilege of working with Councilman Phillips and Mayor Sammy Phillips for over eight years now, and I can honestly say that his passion for public service is an example and an inspiration to all of us. His bio shows that he worked to enhance his education and knowledge so that he could be an example for others, and I know that he's made a tremendous impact in our community. As mayor of this great city, you have led us through the largest growth this city has ever had, and virtually no at virtually no impact to our citizens. We are grateful to have you as our mayor. And so on behalf of the city council, the citizens, and the staff, I congratulate you for your 40 years of service, and we are very grateful. So thank you, and I'll hand the microphone over to you. But before I do that, let me present you the certificate. To thank Thanks, you for your service. Appreciate it. And your friendship. That's a long time. Wow, I'm stunned. I didn't realize I'd been here that long. Um, loved every minute of it. I mean, it's not to say that it has it had its ups and downs, you know, especially working in police. And there's times when, you know, you get a little frustrated as a cop when you see some of the things that you see. You know, you see a lot of the bad, the bad in people, but you do have the opportunity to see the good. And I've seen a lot of good in this community. That's why I feel it's incumbent on me to main, to continue uh, after my retirement with the police department and the leadership position of the city because I felt like I had something, I had something to offer and, uh, and I felt that my city could gain, you know, through my leadership. Um, I didn't want to leave police when I did you know, because uh, we kind of had nurtured the department into, into shape over about a 15, well, longer than that, probably about, a, about almost a 20 year period. But when, when Mike Canero came on board and took over the reins, you know, I felt like, hey, we got a winner here, you know, and, and I knew that he would be able to take this department and continue it on with the same passion that I had when I left. And uh, he has not let me down, not one bit. Uh, I think we have a fine police department that continues to improve and grow. Uh, we've got some great officers out there. I don't know half of them anymore, you know, uh, but that's my fault. But anyway. Um, but I, I'm really shocked uh, to be, uh, be honored. I'm very humbled to be honored uh, tonight. Uh, and, and like I said, I, I thought it had only been about 10 years, you know, but I guess 40. 
that, that's testimony of something else too that I don't really want to get into at this point in time, but uh, I guess that kind of means that I got to be at least 60 something years, 61 to be standing here with 40 years since you have to be 21 to be a policeman. But anyway, thank you very much, Council. I'm going to tell you something. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. And I got to say, before I go back up there and take the position, assume the position that I, could, I couldn't choose a better group of people to work with, you know, to work through the uh, trials and tribulations of our city and to be able to keep us on the right path. You know, I mean, over the time, uh, we've had a few scuffles here and there between some of us and everything, but I'm going to tell you what. I wouldn't trade this group of folks behind me for all the tea in China. Not, not to offend the Chinese, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, a great group to work with. And this is a wonderful city, which I love with all my being, okay? I've had opportunities to leave, but I haven't because this is my home. This is where I, continue, I, I, I plan to stay. Uh, as long as we got the great staff that we have and I got these fine folks working, I, 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 don't, think, I, I don't know if I'll make it to 50, but we'll give it a shot. Thank you. Surprise me. <laughs> uh, take me a minute to get over there. I got the vapors. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this uh, this brings us into crashing into the uh, first session of public comment for the evening. I have one person that signed up, and this is a uh, uh, Tammy Dean. Tammy. Hi, how you doing? My name is Tammy Dean, and this is Cindy, and I am a peer support specialist. Um, a peer support specialist is basically um, peers helping peers, and we're trying to form a peer recovery center here in Onslow County. Right now we have one in um, Craven County, Wilmington, and Carteret County, and we're trying to get one here in Onslow County. Um, we're actually asking for um, assistance of Onslow County to assist us and uh, support us in you know, this project and finding location. Um, basically being a peer support specialist, uh, we, we just don't do mental illness. We deal with um, people that has depression and suicidal, um, domestic violence, rape, alcoholism, and drug abuse. And it's a free center and it's an educational center where they will come and, you know, take classes and, you know, just help them be um, productive citizens back in the community. Um, a lot of our, uh, the people, they go to ER when they just need someone to talk to. This center will be a 24-7 um, center where they can come and there's other peers that's there that been through the same path and um, the same journey they've been down. So it's best for them to deal with someone that's able to um, uh, pretty much uh, relate to what they've been through. And um, so we have a lot of different uh, programs that we're doing, 12-step um, programs, AA, NAMI. Um, we're looking for a location, you know, so that we can help them. And the recovery is basically um, an individual journey. And we have a lot of vets that's in the area that are homeless or just need someone to talk to. Um, they depression and PTSD, and we have a lot of peer support specialists that are vets that vets help invest, you know, try to get back in the community and in society. Hmm. Go ahead. Cindy. Um, the other counties that she mentioned, the counties have been able to um, offer a location, a building for like a dollar a year. It's, they've seen the need in the county and um, it's, it's really a great need. I know I've got 30 seconds. Um, in Onslow County, they wanted to center this one in Jacksonville because of the military and just because Jacksonville is a wonderful city. Just wondering if, if, if we wanted to, to ask you if maybe the city council knew of any buildings that y'all might have that y'all might uh, be able to help us with to get this started. 
and um, it's a great opportunity. The information is before y'all, and we appreciate your time. And that's up. Thanks for coming tonight. Okay, before I go to the first agenda item tonight, I'm going to go ahead and take a real brief res respite here just a moment. I know some of you may want to go home and watch TV or something and leave us up here to do this work. Now, you're welcome to stay. By all means, please do if you want to stay. I don't know why you would want to, but please. So this is the this is coming up again for agenda item number one. This is the repeal of the city of uh, Jacksonville zoning ordinances uh, and subdivision ordinances and adoption of unified development ordinance and the new official zoning map. And Ryan, you're going to go ahead and present on this item. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Um, as you recall, last month the city council opened and closed the public hearing to consider the um, repealing of the current zoning and subdivision ordinance and current zoning map and replacing that with adopting the Unified Development Ordinance and the associated zoning map that includes the adult business, billboard overlay, flight path overlay, uh, based on the findings of fact A through D. Um, at the public hearing, there was uh, several people that spoke with concerns, many of which we discussed with uh, after the public hearing, and we're pretty sure that we've got everything addressed. The one item that remained um, in question was dealing with the multifamily dwellings within the corridor commercial zoning district and uh, Dr. Woodruff sent some information out to City Council and um, with five options for City Council cons to consider and um, I'll go over those options with you real fast uh, one would be to uh, not allow the multifamily within the corridor commercial zone which would require anybody that would like to build an apartment complex within that zone to first rezone it to residential multifamily high density. The second option would be to allow multifamily as a permitted use as it is in today's ordinance. The third option would be to allow multifamily uh, dwellings in the quarter commercial zone as a special use which would require city council approval uh, for each one of those locations. The fourth one would be a combination of permitted and special uses within the quarter commercial zone. And the one that, that council has, I believe, come to a consensus on would be to not allow multifamily dwellings within 350 feet of the main roadway, but beyond 350 feet, it would be a permitted use. And I've got a, two slides to show you that would kind of demonstrate approximately the 350 foot mark. Uh, this is Western Boulevard mm -hmm. and Carolina Forest. And the red line indicates the 350 foot setback that would be required from the right of way line back 350 feet. So, to put it in perspective, this is the Longhorn under the F of family, and the hotel that's under construction is right behind that. That's approximately 350 feet to kind of give you an idea on where that line would be, as well as the new road uh, on the commercial development where Zaxby's and the Eye Care Center and Wilmington Healthcare is being constructed, that's approximately where the road is, so that's within close proximity to 350 feet. 
So if a multifamily development wanted to occur, it would have to be constructed at that point there versus on the out parcel up front. So we are prepared to make the adjustments to the use table uh, pending city council's direction and hopefully adoption of the code with whatever provision city council would like to see as it relates to multifamily. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I would turn it over to Dr. Woodruff at this time in case he would like to add anything. The other thing I want to verify, where uh, apartment complexes have been built within that 350 foot zone, the staff has proceeded to rezone them to the high density multiple family so they're not non-conforming. So for example, if you were to move a little further up this road on Western Boulevard, you would come to, I believe it's Arlington Apartments. That's right, Windsor and Arlington right off the screen yeah. there. Because those sit in the 350 foot area, then we, are, we have rezoned them. If you take the action tonight to adopt the map as currently prepared, they will be automatically rezoned to high density multiple family, thereby being a permitted use. And that rezoning to residential multifamily high density addressed the concerns that legal counsel raised on behalf of East Carolina Community Development because they have several projects that are zoned quarter commercial and they were concerned about becoming non-conforming, so. Council, any questions of Ryan? All right, Council, I'll pose to you, I know there's more people in attendance tonight. Uh, we did have a public hearing uh, at the last, was the last meeting? Yes, sir. And we opened and closed it. Uh, I'm gonna leave it to Council to decide whether or not you want to um, uh, reopen the public hearing in this matter to give some citizens the opportunity to speak that may not have been here for the previous public hearing. But it would have to be done through a motion, so. Mayor, you, you might want to ask if anyone is here to is speak. Here? And is there anyone here that wished to speak that weren't, weren't here for the public hearing? Well, I guess that kind of takes care of that yes. then, doesn't it? And also, oh, Reverend Brown. Okay. Reverend Brown. All right. I'll make a motion that we open the public hearing. Okay. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Reverend Brown. <coughs> Mr. Mayor and Council, I was at that earlier meeting and I did raise some concerns. Uh, as a pastor, it is naturally my concern if any of my members or people that I minister to are going to be adversely affected. I've also talked with the mayor and I've asked that as we do this, even as we do it, let's be considerate of anybody who would be adversely affected and see if we cannot set something up. I trust the mayor and council to look out for the least of these, those who are most vulnerable. I do know of some persons who, for example, are in mobile dwellings, and in the event of a hurricane or of a, or of a fire, let's be considerate. What I would ask you simply to do, and I'm willing to do this too, and that is if somebody's gonna be adversely affected, those of us who are strong, let's put our shoulders together, get our minds in sync, and see what we can do to make sure those persons are not injured. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I would also like to uh, commend uh, Dr. Brown. He came and talked with the staff on several occasions. Uh, we have offered uh, explanations in a number of areas. Uh, I must admit that there are certain situations such as the homeless shelter that they currently operate on Court Street. They are non-conforming today. They will be non-conforming if you adopt the UDO. There are also situations where mobile homes exist today that are non-conforming. They're going to exist tomorrow. What we pledge to, to you, though, is to remember that while we've been on this journey for five or six or seven years to get to this adoption, the journey is not over by adopting. We know from past experience, both in professional life and with other governments, 
that when you adopt a UDO, you are always going to find those things probably tomorrow morning that you said, oh, I didn't realize that was there. I want to, to pledge to you that the city staff will bring to you refinements over the next months, months, and months. It wouldn't surprise me that if by this time next year we will not have brought, that we would not have brought to you at least a half dozen tweaks, amendments that we will be suggesting to you. So in honor of uh, certainly what Dr. Brown said and in honor of what you, the mayor and council have told us, we put together the best document we can, but we all recognize that there will be amendments and we pledge to you we will handle those in a timely fashion. All right, I guess we'll close that little part of the public hearing that we reopened. And uh, council, you're being asked to, uh, to get rid of the, or, <laughs> Excuse me, just a minute. You're being asked to uh, repeal the um, current city Jacksonville uh, zoning and sub subdivision ordinance and enact the UDO. Mayor Phillips, I move that we repeal the zoning and subdivision ordinances, adopt the unified development ordinance, the UDO, and the new official zoning map, that it includes the existing adult business, billboard, and flight path overlay districts, based on findings of fact A through D being found in the affirmative and that the zoning advances the public interest and also adopting option number five as part of the uh, motion. Second. Motion and second. John, does that satisfy? Yes, for the, just for the record, the option number five would, again, in the commercial corridor, uh, restrict the first 350 feet to be truly commercial. The residential with multifamily would not be permitted except beyond that, just for the, the record. And we have the, the exact wording. Yes, sir. That's an option five, right? Yes. Okay. Second. I have a motion and a second. second. Have we already had a second? Mm -hmm. yeah, Jerry, so Jerry deserves okay. that. Any uh, further discussion? Discussion. Mr. Willingham. Um, I know there's a concern about um, mobile homes, and there are quite a few mobile homes in my ward. I'm not anti-mobile home. I'm pro-economically diverse <coughs> neighborhoods. Um, I've been committed to the equity of um, all of our areas of the city of Jacksonville. Um, we have a diverse community in Belfort Homes, economically diverse. Um, years ago, they came to us with the concern of um, mobile homes being developed near them. Uh, we um, resorted to an ordinance at that time that um, provided for the enhancement of that community, and it's fared uh, very well. Um, there have been a lot of things that over the years have um, challenged us with, with the zoning, particularly in, in Ward 1. I remember the time when most of the properties in Ward 1 were, were uh, zoned R5. We had very few lots in downtown Jacksonville that were R5. One of the responses was that, well, buy your neighbor's lot if you want to build. That wasn't good enough uh, then because there was an effort on um, city council to be equitable um, throughout the city with respect to zoning and particularly in Ward 1. So we created the Residential uh, 3 um, uh, zone where you only had to have 3,000 square feet. and um, most of the properties conform to that. So the council and I have had a history of looking out for um, the particular issues that impact um, um, Ward 1 and the, the property owners with um, smaller property sizes and everything. And we've done it pretty effectively through zoning. Uh, when we took on the challenges of the Kerr Street community, there was a lot of criticism about gentrification um, that people were going to lose properties because of uh, tax increases and that the improvements weren't really for the people who lived there. I, I hold that up as an example of um, 
economic diversity, that program that we put in place to look out for um, uh, disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged people was a nationally awarded program with the Audrey Nelson Award. So I, I applaud the council. I think we've done pretty good with um, trying to look out for the, the less fortunate. Uh, and I think downtown Jacksonville is, is, is proof of that. And I get the question all the time. You've concentrated on, on Jacksonville. When are you going to do something for Georgetown? I think I can comfortably say with confidence that if we hadn't made the changes um, to the ordinance, um, used to be a lot of mobile homes downtown. If we hadn't made the changes to the ordinance, we wouldn't have been able to benefit the affordable housing program because the way we did that, it took private partner um, partnering and a lot of the houses uh, some of the houses aren't affordable housing through our program. The contractors did that because they bought into how we were trying to improve the neighborhood. So that was the way that that worked to help um, economically disadvantaged people. So this is a model, the downtown, and, it, and it's working. What we've tried to do recently is reach out to um, a couple of the churches, and we can reach out to more. Um, I believe Dr. Woodruff has met with uh, St. Julia and J.T. Kerr on um, housing initiatives and, and affordable housing. That's the way I would like to see us look out for the least among us. If we come together and we partner and we preach uh, appreciation, getting into investments of, of real estate that appreciate and not depreciate. So I'm wholeheartedly in support of our new UDO and um, um, I encourage the adoption. Thank you. Thank you. Before you have final vote, we do want to clarify and read one statement regarding the applicability. It says at the end of the ordinance, this ordinance shall be in full force and effect on July 1, 2014. However, any citizen that desires to switch over to and apply the UDO prior to July 1, 2014 can opt to do so. Why did we do that? We know that there are, for example, buildings that are currently in the process of being permitted. We want those to be able to issue, to be issued under the code that the design professional started. We know that they're houses. We know on the same time, we want to go ahead and allow a person who wants to apply this to their property immediately to do so. And let me give you an example. Uh, Ryan has been working and, and his staff have been working with a redevelopment plan out in the uh, uh, ETJ, extraterritorial jurisdiction area. The use that they were going to put in this vacant building is a use that would require currently a special use permit. However, through the adoption of the UDO, it becomes a permitted use. So literally, if you vote on this tomorrow morning, that redevelopment project can move forward without having to go through the public hearing process because in your analysis, you're recommending that becomes a permitted use, not a special use. And therefore, we want to make sure everybody understands there's basically going to be a dual set of codes that will work for the next several months. For clarification purposes for me, Ryan, I need you to come back up. Um, in regards to what Mr. Willingham's saying there, um, with the, in respect to the mobile homes, I, I feel the same way he does, but also understand what uh, Reverend Dr. Brown's talking about there with adversely impacting people, you know, that are probably there by way of being less fortunate or or for some circumstance you know that's their 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 home you know in that Collins Heights trailer park mm -hmm. mobile home park does that cease to be in business uh, what is that zoning there now it's zoned RM5 it becomes RMF LD a mobile home park is a special use permit they're an existing non-conforming today because they do not have a special use permit. They will be a non-conforming mobile home park should this, uh, this ordinance be adopted. There's really the, no change. How many of the original residents are there? Well, let me, let me back up. There's a big 
there's a big parcel where there's 30 or 40 mobile homes that sit on it, and then you have individual parcels that have one on it per lot. So right. I think it depends on, I don't know how many of the original that are there. There's the, the road that goes all the way around the big island, that's one large tract of land, and that is deemed a mobile home park. And it's non-conforming today, it will be non-conforming tomorrow. So how about Holiday Mobile Home City? It is a non-conforming mobile home park today because they do not have a special use permit. It will be a non-conforming mobile home park tomorrow. Hmm. This ordinance, the UDO does not change that fact whatsoever. Okay, so it, I mean, it really doesn't come into play here. It would have to. Okay. It, gotcha. Okay. Just curious. Okay. Um, we have a motion, second. Anybody else want to discuss? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries unanimous. Uh, that brings us to our last section of public comment. Uh, I don't have anybody else signed up. Did somebody slip in and didn't sign up? Don't see anybody. So let's move on to the reports. Mr. Willingham, I'll start with you, sir. No report. Mr. Bittner. Which you is, I bookmarked my report. And you lost it. Now I can't figure out where the bookmark is. But it was very simple. On loss of meth last week, routine business, nothing that was really of direct impact to the city. Board of Adjustment, its regularly scheduled quarterly meeting was canceled because I guess that's good news. There was no cases to be held. That's all I have to report on. Mayor Pro Tem was on. Thank you, Mayor. Very quickly, I want to pass out a couple items uh, to report uh, from DOT, some transportation projects. I want to highlight and make sure everybody's aware. That's uh, what I'm passing before you is an update on various different projects that you could read. But I just want to highlight a couple of uh, items on Western uh, and US 17 traffic congestion. Uh, we're taking a three-part strategy to address this congestion, which includes signal timing adjustments, and that's ongoing. We are going to lengthen the turn lanes from Marine Boulevard onto Western. This, uh, this will be occurring uh, spring, early summer. And then, of course, the ITS project, which will improve the ability to coordinate the signals on both corridors to reduce congestion. Uh, we're still looking into additional signage and pavement markings as we proceed further to help move that traffic along as, as we uh, uh, see it fit. Hargett Street resurfacing, I know that's a big topic. We're milling the road surface, uh, exposed uh, unanticipated repairs that need to be made before the final paving can occur. The repairs are now well underway and final paving is expected this weekend and wrapping up early next week. So that's a very good news. And that's, of course, weather permitting. There may be some rain coming in this weekend. Pavement markings and final touch-up work will come in the next few weeks uh, with some intermittent lane closures as they're doing that. Um, new pavement markings will include center turn lanes, bicycle lanes on the section of Hargett Street between New River Drive and Bell Fork Road. Uh, the final traffic pattern between New River Drive and Johnson Boulevard is in place. And um, following the resurfacing project, the city has partnered with NCDOT to install enhanced pedestrian crossings at the intersection of New River Drive and Bell Fork Road. <coughs> The US 258 Ridge Road Blue Creek, earlier this month, the city and the county and MPO approved resolution supporting the installation of a traffic signal at the intersection of 258 Ridge Road and Blue Creek Road. Mm -hmm. Members of our local delegation are pursuing funds through the General Assembly to install the signal. An article in Daily News last week indicated that NCDOT may not pursue installation of the signal, however, Discussion at the TAC meeting on the 10th indicated that there was support to move forward. I think that that project's moving along uh, just fine, and I think uh, we can feel pretty confident in that. And you have the rest of the updates that I just handed to you. Also, very quickly, the Tourism Development Authority is having its strategic discussion, um, which will include our long-range capital budget discussion. 
April 24th, 9.30 a.m., and it is open to the public. The Assistant Secretary for Travel and Tourism in the state, Whit Tootle, will lead the conversation and will also include the County and Sports Commission. The authority will hear these reports and then consider the awards for tourism promotion funding. The uh, meeting's in room A and B at City Hall, and it is open to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Washington. Um, I just want to comment from the Environmental and Appearance Advisory Committee that the 34th Annual Arbor Day Observance for the City of Jacksonville is set for 9.30 a.m. at Wooten Park on this coming Friday, the 25th, and the city is hoping it will be able to win the 35th Tree City U.S. Award to be presented that day. Also, on a personal note, um, my brother, Billy Ray Washington, and I would like to thank the city of Jacksonville, um, the various different departments within the city of Jacksonville that on March 31st, um, there was a brick ceremony in honoring my brother Lemuel Washington, affectionately known as Woody Washington, with his, with his more than 20 years of service, but unfortunately due to his untimely death, the bricklaying ceremony was basically to attribute his services while still serving the city of Jacksonville. So on behalf of my family and I, we would just like to just say to the city of Jacksonville, thank you so very much for remembering our brother. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mike's report reminded me that I meant to say uh, thanks and Congratulations to a good job to Wally and Pete Deaver and all the people that got the Henderson Drive sewer renovations done over the past couple of weeks over the spring break. It was, it was a little exciting. Felt like you were doing the what is that when you drive race through town? Slalom. Yeah. And stuff. <laughs> and, uh, during that time, I was riding around town with Kathy and my wife Kathy, and we were going by the uh, Jacksonville Parkway at the time, and they had numerous barrels and between Henderson Drive and the Jacksonville Parkway, I said, Kathy, I, I feel like I'm living in a big city. <laughs> and well, she, assured, she assured me, coming from a big city, that we didn't live in a big city, but it, it did seem like it for a while there with those, those diversions that we had to put up with, but it's, it's come along real nice. Thank you. Bob? Just proud to be here, sir. No report. Proud to have you here. Thank you. Dr. Woodruff. I remember the council, uh, several things. Number one, the, the public may notice that the council is going through an exercise that will convert us from a paper agenda that looks like this and many times is three and four inches thick. We are now going to electronic on May the 6th, I'm sorry, May the 7th, because that's one of the announcements. Our next city council meeting will not be on Tuesday the 6th. It will be on Wednesday the 7th. That's because of the election. At that time, we are asking council to come prepared to do full electronic. Now, why is this important? If you could see literally the thousands of pages of material that we print in the course of 22 to 23 city council meetings, and again, another 23 to 30 workshops, and you can replace that expenditure on the part of the public, because these things are not printed free. It takes staff time, it takes a lot of paper, we are moving to the electronic age. Uh, I'm not so sure that I'm gonna get there as quickly as some of the council members are, but uh, we do want you to have patience so that when you see the council up here looking and uh, looking like they're lost, it's because they're trying to figure out how to work their iPads to make this thing work. But that's a step in the right direction. We'd also remind the public that the city council hosts four special events a year. And we are pleased that on May the 3rd, which is Saturday, at Jacksonville Commons, we will have the Jacksonville Jamboree. That will start at approximately 11 o'clock in the morning. We have great food, great entertainment all day long. Uh, there's going to be a talent show. Uh, if you would like to come out, there are going to be ball uh, field activities, sporting activities, and just a great day. So we hope you will come up to the Jacksonville Commons. Uh, the other thing that we would like to mention is, it's uh, funny, Mr. Lazara mentioned the Hargett Street paving. Well, Mayor, I got a call today from a woman who is complaining about speeders on Hargett Street. <laughs> so apparently, for years we've had all the traffic calming in the form of potholes, but we now have the smooth asphalt and people are feeling like that 
people are going too fast. So, you know, it's just part of life. But when we are talking about Hargett, we want to remind the public that part of the resurfacing is going to result in a different circulation pattern at the city cemetery. For years, you have been able to enter the cemetery basically on the arch there where 24 and Hargett are located. That entrance is being closed for safety purposes. The formal entrance will be down half the way down the cemetery at Woodland, Woodlands you will then be able to come through the cemetery and exit only, but you'll be able to exit onto 24 by a new driveway that the city is currently installing. Beyond that, Mayor and Council, it's an honor to work with you. We thank you for the service you give this community and your leadership. And Mayor, congratulations on 40 yeah, years. Thank you, that was a surprise. Mr. Carter. No report, congratulations, Mayor. Thank you. We'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed?